I have to confess something. I love Bayesian modeling. I don't know if you could have seen that coming. And I love it, not only because it allows me to model interesting phenomena and learn about the world I live in, but because it's part of a broader epistemological framework that confronts me with deep questions. How do you make decisions under uncertainty? How do you communicate risk and uncertainty? What does being rational even mean? Thankfully, Gert Gijonrenser is there to help us navigate these fascinating topics. Gert is the director of the Harding Center for Risk Literacy of the University of Potsdam, Germany. Also director emeritus at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development, he's a former professor of psychology at the University of Chicago and distinguished visiting professor at the School of Law of the University of Virginia. Gert has written numerous awarded articles and books, including Risk Savvy, Simple Heuristics That Make Us Smart, Rationality for Mortals, and his latest, How to Stay Smart in a Smart World. As you'll hear, Gert has trained US federal judges, German physicians, and top managers to make better decisions under uncertainty. But Gert is also a banjo player has won a medal in judo and loves scuba diving, skiing, and above all, reading. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 92, recorded August 25, 2023. Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, for any info about the podcast, learnbasedstats.com is Laplace to be, show notes, becoming a corporate sponsor, supporting LBS on Patreon, unlocking Bayesian merch, everything is in there. That's learnbasedstats.com. If with all that info, a Bayesian model is still resisting you, or if you find my voice especially smooth and want me to come and teach Bayesian stats in your company, then reach out at alex.andora at pymc-labs.io or book a call with me at learnbaystats.com. Thanks a lot, folks, and best Bayesian wishes to you all. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. What's a Bayesian? It's someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional and when I kick a flow mostly I'm watching eyes widen maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming. How would I know unless I'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like I'm Richard Feynman. Hello my dear Bayesians. I just wanted to say that it has been really fun to start coaching you one-on-one -on -one to jumpstart your own learning and Bayesian models. I started doing that a few weeks ago and I love it. Now, I am obviously biased, so I will let one of my students do the talking. As Bart says, you gave me supremely competent direction on a matter of great interest to me. I would be aimlessly wandering the desert of statistics without your advice. Thank you so much, Bart, for your wonderful and surprisingly poetic testimonial. Now, if you too feel a bit stuck or lost on your Bayesian project, check out my one-on-one -on -one coaching packages on topmate.io slash Alex underscore Andorra, and we will knock that Pimesy model out of the park. And now, let's go on with the episode. Gerd Gigerenser, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot for taking the time. I am very happy to have you on the show. A few patrons have asked for your episode, so I am glad to have you here today. And thank you very much to all of you in the Slack, the LBS Slack, who recommended Gert for an episode on the show. And yeah, I have a lot of questions for you because you've done a lot of things. There is a lot of questions I want to ask you on a lot of different topics. But first, as usual, let's start with your origin story, Gert. And basically, how did you come to 
the world of study of rationality and decision making under uncertainty? I've been observing myself how I make decisions. For instance, mm -hmm. in an early career, I was a musician playing Dixieland, jazz, and other things. Did my PhD work, I had to make a decision whether I want to continue a career on the stage as a musician or to try an academic career. Mm -hmm. And for me, music was the safe option because I knew, and also I earned much more money than an assistant professor. An academic career, I couldn't know whether I can make it, whether I would ever become a professor, mm -hmm. but it was the risky option. So this is, if you want an initial story, I decided then for take the uncertainty. Makes sense. And so that's that was like pretty early in your career, or is that something that came later on when you already had started studying other things, or you started doing that as soon as you started your undergrad studies? And what came later was that I learned about theories about decision making. Mm -hmm. And some of them I found very unrealistic mm -hmm. and strange. And about topics that were not really the topics where I thought are important, like, mm -hmm. which job do you take? What do you do with the rest of your life? Huh? But mm -hmm. there were monetary gambles, whether you want $100 for sure, or 200 with a probability of 0.4 yeah. or 6. I also spent an important year of my life at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Bielefeld mm -hmm. on a group called the Probabilistic Revolution. That's an international and interdisciplinary group that investigated how science changed from a deterministic worldview to a probabilistic one. I learned so much. I was one of the young guys in this group. There were people like Thomas Kuhn, Ian mm -hmm. Hacking, Nancy Cartwright. That also taught me something. It's important not to read in your own discipline and do what the others do, but to fall in love with a topic like decision-making and uncertainty mm -hmm. in the real mm -hmm. world, and then read everything that people have written about that. And that means from areas like biology, animal behavior, to economics, to sociology, to the history of science. Yeah, that's that was something really interesting when preparing the episode with you to see the yeah the whole arc of your career being yeah being basically around around these topics that that you've studied really a lot and in depth. So that was really super interesting to to notice. And so something I'm wondering is if you remember how you first got introduced to Bayesian methods. No. Oh. <laughs> For instance, I, I read Fisher's Statistical Methods and Scientific, no, the other way around, Scientific Method and Statistical Inference. Mm -hmm. That was Fisher's third book. We starts out by praising a guy named Thomas Bayes for having the insight not to publishing his paper. Because, according to Fisher, that's not what you need in science. And I got very much interested in the uh, fights between statisticians in something that could be called insult and injury. And uh, Fisher, for instance, in the, same, in the same book, he destroys Carl Pearson, his mm -hmm. successor, you know, mm -hmm. saying the terrible weakness of his mathematical and scientific work flowed in, from his incapacity of self-criticism. So if you want to get anyone interested in statistics, then start with the controversies. That's my advice. And the pity is that in the textbooks in psychology, certainly, all the controversies have been eliminated. One is, doesn't mention them and talks as if there would be only one kind of statistics. So that could be Fisher's null hypothesis testing, which has been turned in a very strange ritual. Fisher never would accept. Or on the other side, also Bayesians, who think it's the only tool in the toolbox. And neither of that attitude is realistic, it's more religious. There is a statistical toolbox, and there are different instruments, and you need to look at the problem to choose the right one. And also within Bayes, there are so many different kinds of Bayesianism. I.J. Good counted, I think, over 64,000. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, that makes it clear. That helps me also understand your your work, because, yeah, something I saw is in your work, you often emphasize the role of heuristics in decision-making. Yeah. So I'm curious, 
if you could explain how Bayesian thinking and heuristics intersect and how do these approaches complement each other in, in navigating uncertainty? First, the term heuristic is mm -hmm. often misunderstood. I mean the term in the sense that Herbert Simon used it to make mm -hmm. a computer program smart or the Gestalt psychologists used it or Einstein used it in the title of his Nobel Prize winning of 1905. I don't use it in the in the sense that it has been very popular in psychology and other fields as heuristics and biases. That's a, a clear misunderstanding. So to make it very short, in a world, Jimmy Savage, which who is often called the father of Bayesian statistics, called a small world where the entire state space is known and nothing else can happen. In that world, the ideal world for Bayesianism and also for most of statistics. In a world where you do not know the state space that the economist Frank Knight called uncertainty or others have called true uncertainty or radical uncertainty, you can't optimize by definition. You cannot find the best solution. And here people and other animals, just like managers and scientists, use heuristics. So a heuristic is a rule that helps you under uncertainty to find a good solution. Mm -hmm. For instance, Polya, the mathematician, distinguished between analysis and heuristics. You need heuristics to find a proof and you need analysis to check whether it was right. Most important, heuristics and analysis are not opposites, as it's now become very popular in system one and system two theories. theories huh? They're not opposites. Mm -hmm. They go together. And for instance, a study of 17 Nobel laureates reported that almost all of them attributed their uh, success from going back and forth between heuristics slash intuition analysis. So that's an important thing. It's not binary opposites. So your question, where does base meet heuristics? Now, of course, for instance, in the determination of the uh, prior probability distribution, uniform priors is a heuristic that's also known as 1 over n. So you divide, for instance, your assets equally over the, the funds or the, or the stocks that you have. It's a reasonable assumption when you know little. And just as 1 over n is reasonable, in some situations, it's not always. And the real challenge is, to find out in what situation does a certain heuristic or does space work and where does it not work. That's what I call the study of ecological rationality. So in short, there's no single tool that's always the best. We need to face difficult question. Can we identify the structure of environments where a simple heuristic like equal distribution yeah. or imitate others works and where mm -hmm. As a mislead. This is really interesting because something also I'm always like I always trying to reconcile and actually you talk about it in your in your book Gut Feelings, the intelligence of the unconscious. Mm -hmm. And you talk also about intuitions and how they can sometimes outperform more complex analytical processes. This is a claim that you can see in a lot of lot of fields, right? Mm -hmm. From I don't know, politics to medicine to sports, when basically people don't really want the the analytical process to be taken too seriously because maybe it doesn't go it doesn't <clears throat> confirm their yeah, yeah. their previous analysis or their own bias. So what I'm wondering is how do Bayesian methods in your research how do Bayesian methods accommodate the role of intuitive judgment? And how can individuals strike a balance between intuitive thinking and the systematic updating of beliefs that we use under Bayesian reasoning? Uh, let me first define what I mean by intuition. Mm -hmm. So intuition is a kind of unconscious intelligence that is based on years of experience with a topic where one feels quickly what one should mm -hmm. do, what one should not do, but one cannot explain it. So when a doctor sees a patient, they may feel something is wrong with that patient, but cannot explain it. That's an intuition based on mm -hmm. years of experience. And yeah. then the doctor will go on and do tests and analysis in order to find out what's wrong, if there's something. So remember, 
intuition and analysis always go together. It's a big error of what we have today in so-called dual processing theories, where they're presented as opposites. And then usually one side is always right, like analysis and intuition is blamed and heuristics are blamed if things go wrong. Yeah. And so how does that then, how does it um, integrate into the Bayesian framework, according to you, in the systematic analysis of, of beliefs that we have in the Bayesian framework? Applications of Bayes use heuristics such as 1 over n. So equal distribution, equal priors. They also use more silent independence assumption and such things. But I would not phrase the problem as how to integrate heuristics in the Bayesian framework. Mm -hmm. I would also not say how to integrate Bayes in the heuristics framework. I think of both. So there are many Bayesian methods and also other statistic methods. They're all optimizing methods. And there are heuristic methods, which are non-optimizing methods. I think of them as part of an adaptive toolbox that humans have, that they can use. And the real art is the choice of the right. So when I should use base and what kind of base? Or when should I use a heuristic, a social heuristic, for instance, mm -hmm. do what Alex tells me to do? Or, for instance, simple heuristics like take the best, which just... Mm -hmm go lexicographically through reasons and stop with the first one that allows to make a decision. And that's the question of ecological rationality. Yes, instance, you have base, uh, examples. Yeah. Base rule huh, is a rule that is reasonable to apply mm -hmm. in situations where the world is stable, where no unexpected things happen, mm -hmm. where you have good estimates for the priors and also good estimates for the likelihoods. For instance, okay. mammography screening is a case. We know that, the, or we can expect that the results of mammography screening won't change very much. We have to take into account that the base rates differ from country to country or from group to group. But besides that, it is a good framework to understand what is the probability that a person has breast cancer if she tests positive. But that's a good situation. But if you have yeah. something which is highly volatile, like, oh, okay, I work with the Bank of England on method to, for regulation, for banking regulation, and that world is highly volatile, and you're not getting mm -hmm. very far with standard statistical methods, mm -hmm. but you may evaluate whether a bank is in troubles by something that we call a fast and frugal tree that only looks at maybe three or four important variables and doesn't combine them in a way as base or as linear models do, but lexicographic. Why? Because, so if you first look, for instance, think about medical diagnosis. If your heart fails, a good kidney cannot compensate that. Mm -hmm. This is the idea of lexicographic and a number of heuristics are lexicographic as opposed to compensatory models like Bayes or linear regressions. Mm -hmm. yeah, I see. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, continue. I have myself trained about a thousand doctors understanding doing Bayesian diagnosis and Bayesian thinking. And you should realize that most doctors, also most gynecologists, would not be able to answer the question I posed before. What is the probability that, that a woman has breast cancer in screening when uh, the mammogram is positive? And if I give them the numbers in conditional probabilities, they're equally lost. Alex, I'll do a test with you. Are you ready? So sure. the point Let's will go. be give you the information in, as usual, in conditional probabilities. And I hope mm -hmm. you will be confused and also okay, the perfect. readers, the listeners. Huh? And then I give, my you, best. I give you the same information in what we call natural frequencies. And uh, then yeah. insight will come. Ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you conduct the mammography screening, what you know is that among the group of women who participates, there is a 1% chance that a woman has breast cancer undetected. Mm -hmm. You also know that the probability that a woman has positive if she has breast cancer is 90%. Mm -hmm. And you know 
that the probability that women should test positive if she does not have breast cancer is 9%. Okay, you have a base rate of 1%, a sensitivity or hit rate of 90%, and a false alarm rate of 9%. Now, mm -hmm. a woman in that group who just tested positive, and you know nothing about her because it's screening, ask you, doctor, tell me, do I now have breast cancer? Or mm -hmm. how certain is it? 99%, 90%, 50%. Please tell me, what do you say? If there's no yeah. fog in your mind, that's the typical situation of most doctors. And there have been conclusions made in psychological research that the human mind has not evolved to think statistically or here, mm -hmm. the Bayesian way. Now, the problem is not in the mind. The problem is in the representation of the information. Conditional mm -hmm. probabilities are something quite new. And few of us have been trained in it. Now, how did humans before Thomas Space mm -hmm. or animals hmm, do Bayesian reasoning, mm -hmm. not as conditional probabilities, but what we call natural frequencies? That is, yeah. I give you first a demonstration, then explain what it is. Yeah? Okay, we, we use the same situation. You do the mammography screening and translate the probabilities into concrete frequencies. Think about a hundred. We expect that one of them has breast cancer and she likely tests positive. That's the 90%. Among the 99 who do not have breast cancer, we expect that another nine will nevertheless test positive. So we have a total of 10 who test positive. Question, how many of them do actually have cancer? It's one out of 10. Mm -hmm. So a woman who tests positive in screening has most likely not cancer. That's good news. So that's natural frequencies that you basically see through. And natural frequencies, we call them because they are not relative frequencies. They're mm -hmm. not normalized. You start mm -hmm. with a group like 100 and you just break it down. And then the computation becomes very simple. Just imagine base rule for this problem. Mm -hmm. And then natural frequencies does the computation, the representation. It's just one out of the total number of positives, 10. That's all. And once doctors have learned that and tried with a few problems, they can generalize it and use the method for other problems. And then we can avoid uh, the errors still in place. And also, doctors can better understand what tests like HIV tests or pregnancy tests actually mean. And the interesting theoretical point is, as Herbert Simon said, the solution to the problem is in its representation. And he asked that from the Gestalt psychologists. Yeah, this is really interesting. I, I really love the... And in a way, that's quite simple to just turn to natural frequencies. So I really love that because mm -hmm. it gives a simple solution to a problem that is indeed quite pronounced where it's just like when you're, even if you're trained in statistics, you have to make the conscious effort of not falling into the, <laughs> the fallacy of thinking, well, if yes. the woman has a positive test and the test has a 99% hit rate, she's got a 99% probability of having breast cancer. Yeah. I have one part of my brain which knows that completely because I deal with statistics all the time. But there is still the intuitive part of my brain, which is like, wait, why should I even wonder if that's the true answer? So I like the fact that natural frequencies give a, an elegant and simple solution to that issue. I put in the show notes your paper about natural frequencies and also mm -hmm. the one you've written about HIV screening and how that relates to, uh, to natural frequencies. So that's in the show notes for for listeners. And I'm also curious, basically, concretely, how you did that with, with the professionals you've collaborated with, because you, your work has involved collaborating with professionals from various domains. That means physicians, that means judges, how I'm curious. So I'm curious how you have applied these principles of risk communication in practice with these professionals and what challenges and what successes have emerged from these applications? I have always tried to connect my theoretical work with practical work. In that case of the doctors, I have been teaching continuing medical education for doctors. So the mm -hmm. courses that I give, they are certified and the doctors get points for that. 
And it may be a group of 150 or so d doctors who are assembled to a day or two days of continuing medical education, and I may do two hours with them. And that has been, for me, a quite satisfying experience because the doctors are grateful because they have muddled through these things for their lives. And now they realize there's a simple solution they can learn within a half an hour or so, and then it sticks for the rest of their lives. I have also trained in the US, so I have lived many years in the US and taught as a professor at the University of Chicago, and I have trained together with a program from George Mason University, US federal judges. These are very smart people, and I enjoy that. So these, these trainings were in illustrious places like Santa Fe, and uh, the judges were included and their partners also included. Mm -hmm. And there was also a series of things like about how to understand fibers, as a, and I was teaching them how to understand risks, decision-making, and heuristic. If you think that federal churches who are among the best one in the US mm -hmm, mm -hmm. would understand base rule. Yeah. Good luck. No, there may be a few, <laughs> most not. And actually, by the way, base rule is forbidden in UK law. Interesting. And uh, But going back, these are examples of, of training that every mm -hmm. psychologist could do. But you have to leave your lab and go outside and talk to doctors and have something to offer them for teaching. By now, the term natural frequencies is a standard term in evidence-based medicine. And I'm very proud about that. Many, and there's also a review, a Cochrane review has looked at various representations and found that natural frequencies are the most powerful ones. We have, with some of our own students who were more interested in children than in doctors, we have posed us the question, can we teach children and how early? And one of the papers I sent you, it's a paper in the Journal of Experimental yeah. Psychology General, yeah. uh, I think two years ago, has for the first time tested fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders, and second graders. So when we did this with the teachers, they were saying, and they were looking at the, at the problems, they were saying, that's much too difficult. The children will not be able to do that. They haven't even had fractions, but you don't need fractions. And uh, for instance, when we use problems that are more childlike, so Harry Potter type of problems. And when they are in natural frequencies, and the numbers are two-digit numbers, you can't do larger numbers yeah, with fourth graders, then the majority of the fourth graders got the exact Bayesian answer. Of course, with conditional probabilism, it would be totally lost. And also we have found that some, maybe 20% of the second graders find the Bayesian answer. The title of the paper is Are Children Intuitive Bayesians? It's in the show notes. Again, in the representation. It's a channel message mathematics that representation of numbers matter. And if you don't believe it, just think about doing a calculation or base rule with Roman numerals. Good luck. That's well known in, in, in mathematics. For instance, the physicist Feynman has uh, made a point that mathematically equally forms of a formula are, despite they are mathematically equal, they're not psychologically the same. Because, as you said, you can see new directions, new guesses, new theories. In psychology, that is not always realized. And what Feynman, Richard Feynman was talking about would be called framing in psychology. And by many of my colleagues, it's considered an error to pay attention to framing. It's not. It's an enabler for intelligent decision making. Yeah, this is fascinating. I really love that. And I really commend your paper that, that you were talking about. Do children have Bayesian intuitions? Because first, I really loved the experiment. I found that super, super interesting to, to watch that. And also, yeah, as you were saying, the, in a way, the conclusion that we can draw from that and basically how this could be integrated into how statistics education is done is yeah. extremely important. And actually, yeah, I, I wanted to, to ask you about that. Basically, if you, what would be the main thing you would change in the way 
statistical education is done. Well, so you're mainly based in Germany. So I would ask in Germany, maybe just in general in Europe, since our countries are, are, are pretty close on a lot of a lot of metrics. So I guess what you're saying for Germany could also be applied for a lot of other European countries. It's actually starting to change. So some of my former postdocs are now professors and some are in education. And for instance, they have done experiments in schools in Bavaria where the textbooks have in the 11th class have base rule and they show trees, but with relative frequencies, not natural frequencies. And they've run a study which basically showed that when the pupils learn in these textbooks base rules with relative frequencies or conditional probabilities, yeah, and you test them later, 90% can't do it anymore. They've done something like road learning, never understood it. And then in class, teachers taught the students natural frequencies they had never learned before. And then 90% could do it, something they had never heard of. My former students convinced the Bavarian government with this study. And now natural frequencies and thus understandable base is part of the mass curriculum in Bavaria. That's a very concrete example where one can help young persons to understand. And when they will, will be older and will be doctors or have another profession where you need base, they will not be so blocked and have to muddle through and not understand. And if they are patients, then they know what to ask and how to find out what a positive HIV screening test really means or a positive COVID test and what information one needs for that. I think that statistical literacy is one of the most important topics that should be taught in school. We have, we still have an emphasis on the mathematics on certainty of certainty. So algebra, geometry, trigonometry, beautiful systems. What's most important for everyone in later life is not geometry, it's statistical thinking. I mean, in practical life. And we are missing to do that. The result is that <laughs> test people, including medical professionals, or we have tested professional lawyers with problems, acquire Bayesian thinking, most are lost. The level of statistical thinking is, is often so low that you really can't imagine it. Here's an example. Two years ago, the Royal Statistical Society of London asked members of parliament whether they would be willing to do a simple statistical test. And about 100 agreed. The first question was, if you throw a fair coin twice, what's the chance that it will land twice on head. Now, if you think that every member of parliament understands that there are four possibilities, two heads or two, so two heads or that's one in four. No, about half understood and the others, no. And the most wrong guess was it's still a half. It's just an illustration of the level of statistical thinking in our society. And I don't think if we would test German politicians, we would do much better. And that's a, you might say, yeah, who cares about coins? Huh? But look, <laughs> there was COVID with all these probabilities. Exactly. There is investment. Mm -hmm. There are taxes. There are tons of numbers that need to be understood. And if you, if you have politicians, that don't even understand the most basic things, mm -hmm. what can we expect? I completely agree. And these are topics we're already tackled in this podcast, especially in episode 50, where I had David Spiegelhalter here on the podcast. And, and we talked about yet yeah, these topics of yeah. <clears throat> communication of uncertainty and, and all these very interesting topics, especially education and yeah. how to include all that in the education. So that's these are very interesting and important topics, and uh, I encourage people to well listen to uh, to that episode number fifty with David Spiegelhalter. I will put it in the show notes. I may add here that David and I have been working together for many years, and <laughs> he has been uh, conducting the Winton Center for uh, Evidence Communication or Risk Communication <laughs> in Cambridge, and I'm still directing the Harding Center for Risk Literacy. And it's both centers were funded by the same person, David Harding, mm -hmm. a long investment banker, 
who had <laughs> insight that there's a problem. The rest of philanthropes don't really seem to realize that it would be important to fund these centers. The Winton Center is now closed down, which is a great pity. And yeah, sure. uh, so there's very little funding for so there's funding for research. So when I do the studies like with children, there's all lots of funding for that. But at the moment, you apply what you learn into the real world to mm -hmm. help the society. Funding stops, huh. except for philanthropes like David Harding. Any idea why that would be the case? The research agencies, they think they have not realized the problem that science is more than having publications. Much of the science that we have is actually useful. That's being realized in if it's about engineering and it's about patent, yes. But that there are similar positive tools that help people like natural frequencies to understand their world and that you can teach them. And then you need a few guys who just go out and teach doctors, lawyers or school children. That is not really in the mind of politicians. Which is which clearly is a shame. Right, because you can see how important probabilistic thinking is in a lot of, in a lot of fields, and and especially in politics, right? even electoral forecasting, which is something I've done a lot. Probabilistic thinking is absolutely, absolutely of utmost, utmost importance, and yet it's not there yet, and not a lot of interest in developing this at least in France, which is where I have done these experiments. So yeah, that's always been puzzling to me, actually. And even in in sports, one of the recent episodes I've done about soccer analytics with Maximilian Goebel, well, that was also an interesting conversation about the fact that basically the methods are there to use the data more efficiently, but a lot of European football clubs don't really use them for some reason, which for me is still a mystery because that would help them make better use of their finite resources and also be more competitive. So yeah, I, that's definitely something I'm passionate to, to understand. So yeah, thanks a lot for doing, doing all that work. I agree well, to I like, try and help instance, us everyone, understand all that. Everyone can help here. Huh? And for instance, most people are with the doctors at some point, like mm -hmm. COVID-19 yeah. or yeah. HIV tests or cancer screening, and everyone could ask the doctor, what's the probability that I actually have the disease or the virus if I test positive? And then you likely will learn that your doctor doesn't know that. Cues. Then you can help your doctor understand that, an actual frequency tree, and show them. I've done yeah. this with many doctors. Oh, yeah? But how, how, how did it go? <laughs> very well. I said, I'm training doctors. I've trained more than a thousand of my own researchers from the Harding Center. Mm -hmm. I've trained more than 5,000 extra. And the last and time I was with my home physician, I spent maybe 50 minutes with him and 40 minutes explaining him on the internet where he finds reliable information. The problem is not in the doctor's mind. The problem is in the education at the mm -hmm. medical departments where doctors learn lots of things, but one thing they do not learn statistical thinking yeah, with sure. very few exceptions and i'm curious the, did you do some follow-up studies on some courts of those doctors where you basically taught them those tools it seemed yeah. to work in the moment when they applied it and then i'm curious basically of the like the retention rate yeah. of these methods basically is it something like oh yeah when you force them in a way to use them yeah they see it's useful that's good but then when you go away, they just don't use them anymore and they just revert to the previous way they were yeah. doing things, which is, of course, uh, suboptimal. So, yeah, I'm curious how... So in, how the, in the continuing medical education, I have about 90 minutes and I teach them many things, not just natural frequencies. When I teach them natural frequencies somewhere in the beginning and I mm -hmm. test them towards the end, that's yeah a short time, a little bit more than an hour. There is no way for me to find these doctors again. But we have done follow-up studies up to three months with students and teaching them how to translate uh, conditional probabilities in natural frequencies. And the interesting thing is that 
the performance, which is after the training, around 90%, that means 90% of all tasks, they get exactly right. After several months, it stays at the same level. Whereas in the group, in the control group, where they're, teach, where they're taught uh, conditional probability, exactly your problem is there. Huh? So they learn it not as well as natural frequencies, but then a few days later, it goes away. And after three months, they're basically down where they started. Mm -hmm. Some representations do not stick in the minds. Frequency representations do, if they are not relative frequencies. Yeah, this is definitely super interesting. So basically to make it stick more, the idea would be definitely use more natural frequencies. Is that... Yeah. Is that what you were saying? Yes. And uh, of course, it doesn't hurt if you continue thinking this way and do some exercise. Yeah. yeah. And something I'm also curious about and that a lot of, a lot of beginners ask me a lot is what about priors? So I'm curious in your job, how did you handle priors and the challenges regarding confirmation bias, persistence of persistence of incorrect beliefs? So in a way, in a more general way, what I'm asking is how can individuals, particularly decision makers in fields like law or medicine that, that very well, avoid the pitfalls associated with biased prior beliefs and harnessing the, the power of patient reasoning? So in the medical domain, particularly in diagnostics, the priors are usually from, they're the usually frequencies. They are estimated by studies. There's always the possibility that a doctor might adjust yeah, frequency base rate because he or she has some kind of belief that these patients may not be exactly from that group. Mm -hmm. But again, there's huge uncertainty about priors. And also, uh, one should not forget there's also uncertainty about likelihoods. Often in Bayesian discussion, the discussion centers among priors. Uh -uh. How do you know the likelihoods? So for instance, the Take the mammography problem again. The probability that you test positive if you don't have cancer, so which I in the example gave us 9%, which is roughly correct, but it varies. It depends on the age of the woman. It depends on quite a number of factors. And one should not forget that also the likelihoods have to have some kind of subjective element and judgment. And then there's a third more general assumption, namely the assumption that the all these terms, the likelihoods and the base rates, which are from somewhere, maybe a study in Boston, would actually apply to a study in Berlin. Mm -hmm. I can name you a few more assumptions that, for instance, that the world would be stable, that nothing has happened. There's no different kind of cancer that has different statistics. So one always has to assume a stable world to do base. Mm -hmm. And one should be aware that it might not. And that's why I, I use the term statistical thinking, because mm -hmm. you need to think about the assumptions all the time and about the uncertainty in the assumptions. And also realize that often, particularly if you have more complex problems, not just one test, but many and many other variables, you might in these situations where base slowly gets intractable, mm -hmm. you might think using a different representation, like what we call a fast and frugal tree. That's a simple way. It's just like think about a natural frequency tree, but it is an incomplete one, where you basically focus on the important parts of the information and don't even try to estimate the rest in order to avoid estimation error. And that's the key mm -hmm. logic of, of heuristics. And the uncertainty, the big danger is that you overfit. You overfit the data. You have mm -hmm. wrongly assuming that the future is like the past. Or to avoid overfitting, as the bias variance dilemma shows in more detail, one needs to make things more simple. Maybe not too simple, but mm -hmm. more simple. And trying to estimate all conditional probabilities may give you a great fit, but not good predictions. Yeah. Uh, so thanks a lot for this perfect segue to my next question, because this is a recurring theme in your work and in your research, simplicity. You, you often emphasize simplicity in decision-making strategies. And so that was something I was wondering about because, well, I of course love 
evasion methods. <laughs> they are extremely powerful. They are most of the time really intuitive to interpret, especially the model parameters. But they can, like, they are complex sometimes. And they appear even more complex than they are to people who are unfamiliar with them precisely because they are unfamiliar with them. Right? So anything of you're unfamiliar with seems extremely complex. So I'm wondering how we can bridge the gap between the complexity of patient statistics, whether real or fantasized, and the need for simplicity in practical decision-making tools, as you were talking about, especially for professionals and the general public, because it's all the, the audiences we're talking about here. So there are two ways. One is you stay within the basic framework and, for instance, avoid estimating conditional probabilities. Mm -hmm. And that would be what's called naive Bayes. Mm -hmm. And naive Bayes can be amazingly good, has also the advantage that it's much more easy to understand than regular Bayes. The second option is to leave the Bayesian framework and study how adaptive heuristics can give you what Bayes makes too complicated and also there's too much overfitting. For instance, if we have studied investment problems, so assume you have a sum of money and want to invest it in assets. Mm -hmm. How do you do it? And there are Bayesian methods that mm -hmm. tell you how to weigh your money in each of these in assets. There is Markowitz Nobel Prize winning method that's standard statistics, the mean variance portfolio that tells you how you should do that. But when Harry Markowitz made his own investments for the time after his retirement, you might think he used his Nobel Prize winning optimization method. No, he didn't. He used a simple heuristic that's called one over N or divide equally, the same as a Bayesian equal prior. And a number of studies have asked how good is one over N compared to the Nobel Prize winning Markowitz model and also modern variants, including Bayesian methods. The short answer is that 1 over N is mostly as good as Markowitz and also better, and also the most modern, sophisticated models that use any kind of complexity cannot really beat it. The more interesting question is the following. Can we identify in what situation a heuristic like 1 over N or any other of the complicated models is ecologically rational. Because before we have talked about averages, you can see, so one over n has no free parameter, very different from base. That means uh, nothing needs to be estimated from data. It actually doesn't need any data. Thus, in the statistical terms of bias and variance, it may have a bias and likely it has. So bias is the difference from the average investment to the true situation, but it has no variance because it doesn't estimate any parameters from data. And variance means uh, it's the uh, it's a deviation of individual estimates from, from different samples around the average estimate. And since there is no estimate, there's no variance. So a Markowitz or Bayesian models, they suffer from both errors. And the real question is whether the sum of bias and variance of mm -hmm. one method is larger than of the other one. And then ecologically rationally means, let me illustrate this with, uh, the, with Markowitz versus <laughs> one away in. So if you have more, if n is larger, then you have more parameters to estimate because the covariances, they just increase. That means more measurement error. So you can derive from that in situations where we have a large number of assets, then the complex methods will likely not be as good. One over n doesn't have more estimation error. It is none anyhow. And then another thing is, if the true distribution of the so-called optimal weights that you only can know in the future mm -hmm. is highly skewed, then one over n is not a good model for that but it's roughly equal, then that's the case. So these are, and then sample size plays a role for the estimation. So the more data you have, the Bayesian or Markowitz model will profit. Doesn't matter one over in heuristic because it doesn't even look at the data. So that's the kind of ecological rationality thinking. And there's some estimates just to give you some 
flesh into that. One study has asked, one study that found that mostly in seven out of eight, I think, tests, one over N made more money in terms of shop ratio and similar criteria than the optimal Markowitz portfolio with 10 years of data. So they asked the question, how many years of data would one need so that the estimates get preciser so that eventually the complex model outperforms the simple heuristic? And that depends on the number of assets you have. And if there are 50, for instance, then the estimate is you need 500 years of stock data. So in the year 2000, 500, we can turn to the complex models, provided the same stocks are still around in the stock market in the first place. That's a very different way to think about the situation. It's the Herbert Simonian way, or don't think about a method by itself. And don't ever believe that a method is rational in every situation. But think about how this method matches with the structure of environment. And that's a much more difficult question to answer than claiming that something is optimal. Yeah, I see. That's interesting. I love the very practical aspect of that, right? And also that, I mean, in a way that focus on simplicity is something I found also very important in the way of basically thinking about parsimony, right? Uh, why make something more difficult when you don't have to? And it's, it's something that I always use also in my teaching where I teach how to build a model. Don't start with the hierarchical time series model, but start with a really simple linear regression with just one predictor, maybe. And, and don't make it hierarchical yet, even though that makes sense yeah. for the problem mm -hmm. at hand, because from a very practical standpoint, if the model fails, and it will at first, if it's too complex, you will not know which part to take apart right, and to make yeah. better. So it's just the parsimony makes it way easier to build the model and also to choose the priors, right? Just uh, don't make your priors too complicated. Find good enough priors because you won't find, there is no best prior. Right? So find good enough priors and, and then go with that. The often use of the term optimal is mostly misleading. Under uncertainty, mm -hmm or intractability, you cannot find the optimal solution and prove it. It's an illusion. Under uncertainty, so when you have to make predictions, for instance, about the future and you don't know whether the future is like the past, then often quite simple heuristics outperform highly complex methods. An example is, <laughs> remember when Google engineers tried to predict the flu with a system that's called Google Flu Trends, and it was a secret system, and it started with 45 variables. They were also secret, and the algorithm was secret. And it ran from 2008 till 2015. And at the very beginning in 2009, the, flying, the swine flu occurred and out of season in the summer. And Google flu trends, so the big data algorithm had learned that the flu is high in the winter and low in the summer. So it, it underestimated the flu-related doctor visits, which was the criterion. And the Google engineers then revised the algorithm to make it better. And here are two choices. One is what I call the complexity illusion. Namely, you have a complex algorithm under high uncertainty, like the flu is a virus that mutates very quickly, and it doesn't work. What do you do now? You make it more complex. And that's what the Google engineers did. So they used a revision with about 160 variables, also secret, thought they would solve the problem, but it didn't improve at all. The opposite reaction would have been, you have a complex and high uncertain problem. You have a complex algorithm. It doesn't work. What do you do now? You make it simpler because you have too much estimation error the future isn't like the past. Mm -hmm. We have tested, also published a paper on a very simple heuristic that just takes one data point. So remember that Google Flu Trends estimated next week's or this week's flu-related doctor visits. So the one data point algorithm is you take most recent data, it's usually one week or two weeks in the past, and then make the simple prediction what it will be this or next week. That's a heuristic which is well 
documented in human thinking is often mistaken as a bias heuristic. And we showed it for the entire run of the of Google Flu trends for eight years. The simple heuristic outperformed Google Flu trends in all updates, there were total, I think, three updates for every year and for each of the updates, reduced the error by about half. You can intuitively see that. So a big data algorithm gets stuck, like if something unexpected happened, like in the swine flow. The recency heuristic clearly adapt to the new situation and improve on that. So that's another example showing that you always should test a simple algorithm first. And you can learn from the human brain. So the heuristics we use are not what the heuristics and bias people think, always second best. No, you need to see in a situation of high uncertainty, pick a right heuristic and a way to find it is to study what humans do in these situations. I call this psychological AI. Yeah, I love that. And actually that, so before closing up the show, that sets us up nicely for one of my last questions, which is a bit more formal thinking, because so you've been talking about AI and these decision-making science. So I'm wondering how you see the future of decision science and where do Bayesian statistics fit into this evolving landscape, especially considering the increasing availability of data and computational power? Okay. So, and that may be related to, to your last, yeah. latest book. Uh, the, my latest book is about, it's called How to Stay Smart in a Smart World. And it teaches one thing, a distinction between stable worlds and unstable worlds. Stable worlds are like what the economist Knight called a situation of risk where you can calculate the risk as opposed to uncertainty. That's unstable worlds. If you have a stable world, that's the world of optimization algorithms, at least if it's tractable. Here, more data helps because you can fine tune your parameters. If you have to deal with an unstable world, and that's most of things are unstable or not just viruses, but human behavior. And complex algorithms typically do not help in predicting human behavior. In my book, I have a number of examples. And here, you need to study smart, adaptive heuristics. And for instance, we are working with the largest rating company in Germany, and they have intransparent, secret, complex algorithms. That has caused an outcry in the public because these are decisions that decide maybe whether you get you are considered for if you want to rent a flat or not, and other things. We have shown them that if they make the algorithms simpler, then they actually get better and more transparent. And that's an interesting combination. Here is one future about solving the so-called XAI problem. First, try a simple heuristic that means a simple algorithm and see how good it is and not just test competitively a handful of complex algorithms, because the simple algorithms maybe do as well or better than the complex ones, and also they're transparent. That means that doctors, for instance, may accept an algorithm because they understand it. And a responsible doctor would not really want to have a neural network diagnostic system that he or she doesn't understand. So. The future of decision making would be, if you want it in a few sentences, take uncertainty serious. Distinguish it from situations of risk. And we are not far ahead in this. And second, take heuristics seriously. Don't confuse them with biases. And third, if you can, go out in the real world and study decision making there. How firefighters like Gary Klein uh, make decisions how chess masters make decisions or how scientists come up with their theories. And you will find standard decisions there that's geared on small worlds of calculable risk will have little to tell you about that. And then have the courage to study empirically what experience people do, how to model this as heuristics and find out their ecological rationality. That's what I see will be the future. Nice. Yeah, I find that super interesting in the sense that it's also something I can see as an attractive feature of the patient modeling framework from people coming to us for 
consulting or education where the fact that the models are clear on the the assumptions and the priors and the structure of the model make them much more interpretable and so way less black boxy than classic AI models. And that's yeah, definitely a trend we see. And that's also related to causal inference. Right? People most of the time want to know if X influences Y and in what way and if that is in a predictable way. And so for that, causal inference fits extremely well in, in the Bayesian framework. So that's also something I'm, I'm really curious about to see evolve in the coming years, especially <clears throat> with some new tools that start to appear, like Ben Vincent lately on the show for episode 97. And we talked about causal pi and how to do causal inference in PyMC. And now we have the new do operator in PyMC, which helps you do that. So I really love seeing all those tools coming together to, to help people do more, more causal inference and also more state of the art causal inference. And for the curious, the, we will do with Benjamin Vincent a modeling webinar in the coming weeks, probably in September, where he will demonstrate how to use the two operator in PyMC. So if you're curious about that, follow the show. And if you are a patron of the show, you will get early access to the recording. So if you want to support the show with a cafe latte per month, I am really thanking you from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> well, Gert, I have so many other questions, but I think it's a good time to, to stop. I've already taken a lot of your time, so I want to be mindful of that. But before letting you go, I'm going to ask you the last two questions I ask every guest at the end of the show. Number one, if you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I would try to solve the, the problem to understanding the ecological rationality of strategies, particular heuristics, and also its hmm. applications. That's a next the real world. Yeah. You're the first one to answer that, and that's a very precise answer. I am absolutely impressed. <laughs> and second question, if you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, alive or fictional, who would it be? Oh, I would love to have dinner with two women. The first one is a pioneer mm -hmm. of computers, Ada Lovelace, and the second mm -hmm. one is a woman of courage and brain, Marie Curie, the only woman. Mm -hmm who got two Nobel Prizes. And Marie Curie said something very interesting. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. Curie said this when she discovered that she had cancer and was soon to die. Extremely inspiring. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gert. That's... Really but inspiring. Having, and, having, uh, let me say, having courage is something that's very important yeah. for every researcher. And also having courage uh, mm -hmm. to look forward, to dare to find new avenues rather than playing the game of the time. Well, on that note, I think, well, thank you for coming on the show, Gert. That was an absolute pre pleasure. I'm really happy that we could have that more, let's say, epistemological discussion than we're used to on the podcast. I, I love doing that from time to time. Also filled with applications and I encourage people to take a look at, at the show notes. I put uh, your books over there, some of your papers, a lot of resources for those who want to dig deeper. So thank you again, Gert, for taking the time and being on this show. It was my pleasure. Bye-bye. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman, with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Endora. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Endora, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learnbayestats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a... Good Bayesian, change your predictions after taking information in. 
And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing Let's adjust those expectations Let me show you how to be a good baby Change calculations after taking fresh data in Those predictions that your brain is making Let's get them on a solid foundation